Hi, it's Tony from CassetteComeback.com. Now, we all know Sony's basic Type 1 range. Starts off with a HF, and then it goes up to a HFS, and ends up at the pinnacle, sometimes one of the pinnacle of cassettes in my opinion, the HFES. Now I know in Japan you also had HF Pro and HFX, but here in Europe this is basically what we got. The video today is about Sony's other Type 1s. Ones that I sort of didn't pay any attention to. I think I had some in the day, thought they were okay, and lately I managed to get hold of some of these and thought, what's it all about? Is it just a wrapper? Is it the variety? Is it just the sense to collect tapes that weren't around for a long time? Or is there actually something good here? And I'm talking about Sony's other Type 1s. Type 1s like the FX. At the HDF, the EF, the EF Super, the Super EF, and stuff like these strange rarities like this one from South America, the Musica. Very interesting looking cassette, that one. So, We've got all of these different cassettes, and it's like, well, what are all these about? If the HF is the entry level, and these are sold cheap, then what's the difference between the FX and the HDF, between the EF and the EF Super and the Super e What are these tapes? Are they all just HF in a different wrapper? What are they all about? So I had a bit of a play, and I've come to some sort of conclusions and some sort of thoughts, theories, but I'm going to let some of the tapes do their own speaking. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the Super EF. Hang on, you've just shown one. Yes, I have shown one. Same wrapper, but two different tapes in it. The top one looks Sony okay, you know, with the uh, spokes, sorry, the holes in the hubs. Yeah, this bottom one doesn't look very Sony. And there's a good reason for that, because if we actually look at the cassettes, this is the Sony Super EF. And this is the other one, which is also a Super EF, the two out of the same wrappers. However, this one here, compared to this Maxell XV, same hubs, same shell. This must have been assembled at least by Saihan. So a Saihan assembled Sony tape. But if we look at the actual tapes themselves, we can see that this is quite dark brown. This is, you know, not a pure ferric, but I don't know if you can tell, this one here, the Saihan one, is a slightly lighter brown than this one. This is a, a darker brown, is a pure Sony one. So, same wrappers, same generation, two different tapes. But if you think that's dark, let's go to the EF. Because if we look... Where's it gone? At the EF tape, which is incidentally in the same type of shell as the Super EF, look how dark that tape is. I mean, really, look at how dark that EF tape is. Not being funny or anything, if I take something like this, one of my favourites, the UXS Ferro Cobalt Type 2, if you look at this EF tape here, look how dark it is compared to a Type 2. If we take, for example, the FX, which is absolutely a ferric, look how brown it is compared to it. So if we just take this HFES out of the equation, look at the EF tape, which is this one, compared to the FX, which is a pure ferric. Not being funny, this colour of a tape says to me, cobalt doping as does that colour. That says cobalt doping as well, compared to a pure ferric oxide. And then we have the other generation, which is the next generation of the EF Super, because it's bizarre. In this generation, which is earlier, you had them in the same shells, and then you had the, the Saihan version at the same time, and then when the next generation came, they put them into this sort of shell. And if we look at the tapes on these two, 
the virtually identical colour. And then the other one that we're going to throw in here is the HDF. And as I'm known now for being a collection terrorist by tearing stuff open, I don't have one of these open, so let's tear one of these open. Now, the HDF is a strange tape because this tape, as far as I know, was only mostly available in the UK in a chain store, which was a catalogue chain store called Index. And this tape is from 1991. But if you look at the tape, that shell screams to me CHF from the 70s. And they ain't normal, you know, spoky, spoky side style of uh, Sony hub. So if we look at the tape in this one, oh, one day I'll remember to have a Bic with me when I do these videos. If we look at the tape in this, this again is a really dark brown, which is more comparable to the, uh, well, it's darker than the Super EF. It sort of is almost, there's a regular EF. I'm getting confused here because these all look the same. Yeah, if you look at it with the EF, the very, very similar tapes. So what's the point of this if you've got the EF already on the market and you've got the Super EF and then you've got the FXI and you understand what I'm getting at here. This whole sort of range of the cheap Sonys is a bit of a mess and it's hard to understand what's what, why it was made, what market it was for, what level it was under it. it it's just a mishmash. So let's now do some taping on them and let's see if I can come to some sort of a conclusion as to what the heck Sony was knocking on about with these tapes. Okay, so I'm going to use my Iowa ADS950 here because I like the visual display meters and stuff. Yeah, the Dragon does it as well, but we'll use the Dragon a bit later. But uh, for now, it's more exploratory. So let's start with the EF. Now, this is a bog standard EF. This is the one with that very black tape. Now, this deck is actually calibrated to UX, but let's calibrate up this EF and let's see what sort of... Uh... So, compared to the UX, which obviously is tight too, but if you can see, this is the hallmark of a good tape, is if the bias and the levels are sort of the same. You know, if you've got levels up there and bias level down there, then you've got a poor tape, but these just need to have the, the level bounced up. So if we give it more record level, okay, there we go. Just give it a touch of positive bias. Okay, we've, we've pretty much got the tape as it should be. So uh, let's play a little bit of music through this. Now, if you look, I've got this set pretty hot. So let's just put it down to five at the moment. Let's put some music through it. I'm just going to be a bit more level. I mean, it does need a lot of level. It's a lot down on level, this. But it gets there. This is the beauty of the three-head decks with VU meters. But as you can see, it's not exactly rock solid. But anyhow... It's a cheap tip. Let's just have a listen to what it sounds like. There's a hiss. Now, this song is another Villa Rosso special. And if you think you can sing this better than the guy who's singing it, which isn't me, do get in touch because I, I would like to release this, but uh, the vocals aren't the best. <laughs> this is a tip, as you can hear, it is quite hissy. Embrace the 
There's a lot of hiss on this tape, but I was recording that at plus six peaks. Plus six on an entry level cheap ferric that's very black. I really, the high hiss, the fact you can take up to plus six, says to me there's cobalt doping in this tape. But let's compare it to. The Super EF. Now, the Super EF, you'd like to think, well, Super Super EF, it's going to be about the same tape. So I'm going to take this Super EF. We've left the bias and levels at the level of the regular EF. Let's see how this one calibrates up compared to the EF, which is below it. Now, if we look here, this actually needs to take the level down... And we also need to add more bias. So it's like these cassettes almost, like I say, cobalt doping, you know, adding more top end. That was the whole point of cobalt dope ferrets. You had more top end and uh, so that they could get the highs better. And these ferrets, again, I mean, like I say, it's a bit unstable here, but this one needs quite a bit of positive bias and a bit less level, but it's there. So I'm going to leave this at the same level as we just recorded the EF at. And let's see. This needs a bit more level again. Make it a bit more solid. And let's see what the Super EF sounds like. See if we've got initially as much hiss. Yep, that's hiss. Right, let's continue with Embrace of Chaos. Hey, you try your best, you get success. You embrace the chaos. Embrace the chaos. Plus six. Listen to the hi hats on the source. Oops. That's a calibration. Let's try the source again. So, okay, so the Super EF again. Browner, but dark tape. Plus six. Uh, hmm. Now, let's go to another tape. Now, this is just the FX. And if we can look here, this is very brown tape. So, there's no cobalt doping going on in this one. This is just a ferric. And I'm imagining... When we calibrate this, it will calibrate quite differently to the EFs. And as you can see, yeah, I mean, the levels are down, but this needs negative bias, whereas the, the EF and the Super EF needed positive bias. This needs negative. So I'm just going to reset the level there, get the bias to where it should be, which is about center, crank it up. And this is a much easier tape to bias than the EF range because basically the bias is smack in the middle which is what this deck is calibrated for UX, and it just needs some level put into it, because obviously it doesn't have the mole. But I'm going to leave this at the same level we were recording the EF range at, and let's see if this FX, pure ferric, can handle the same sort of levels, plus six, or whether it distorts. So let's have a listen. Hold on tight It's gonna be Let's go, one let's go back to the source. Don't worry, baby, we'll be all right. We are 
going on the, right I don't know if I've got a broken deck or not or broken ears but this shouldn't really have been able to take plus six and you know just get away with it so not that I don't trust this Iowa but I need to move this onto a different deck so let's do a quick jump cut smooth eh okay Let's pull this FX and the Dragon. Dragon's been calibrated and serviced recently by BMW. I've calibrated the tape up. Let's have a see if it can handle plus six in the Dragon or whether the Iowa's FL, the FL meters are wrong or whether this is as good as we seem to think it is. Right, brace the chaos again. Yes, you get success. If you embrace the chaos Embrace the chaos Do what's right at all costs It handled that really well, really well. So let's try one more tape and we're going to have another quick jump cut. So this time I'm going to use this tape. I really like this. I mean, I really like the CHF because the CHF was the first tape I ever remember buying with my own money. But CHFs right now, you know, they're a late 70s tape. You very rarely see them for less than £6 a tape, and I'm sorry, they're just not worth that, sonically. Nostalgia, yeah, sonically, no. And that's why I like this HCF. It's got the same sort of shell, paper label. However, this has 90s tape in it, and I've calibrated the Dragon up for this tape, and I'm going to play you some of my first ever release, which some of you have actually gone on to Bandcamp and bought, so thank you very much for that. But I'm going to turn this down. I'm going to run this just at 3 I'm going to run it, um, sorry, peaking, peaking at around three, yeah. And uh, just have a listen to this basic ferric in a decent deck. Because here's the thing, and um, this is the conclusion I've come to on this journey I'm sort of having with cassettes. And so far as the deck is more important than the cassette. This deck can make a mediocre tape sound good, i.e. give a good recording on it. And there are two types of recordings, I keep saying. Ones that sound good and ones that don't. And if it sounds good, it sounds good. If you're comparing between the source and the tape all the time, then you can spot differences. But after that's been done, when you're listening to a tape in the future, you can't compare it to the source. You can just listen to the tape. And it either sounds good or, if it, or it doesn't. And like the legendary engineer Joe Meek said, if it sounds good, it is good. So I'm finding more and more because the amount of new old stock type 2 is depreciating get to know your type 1 ferrics that are very common and cheap and easily available because a good deck and i'm not talking about the dragon that iowa i just used before you can get one of them for less than 100 quid a good deck can make the most of these tapes and you can start making good recordings without breaking the budget okay so let's just listen to tears in rain on this hdf and you can listen to how good a basic ferret can sound.
Jesus Souls. Basic, cheap, ferrix. Don't turn your nose up at them. Get to know them because soon they are going to be the only cassettes that are readily available at a price that's worth recording on. Trust me on this. So, is there any sort of conclusion here? Well, there's always theories. Don't know about facts, but just theories. And here's my theory. While Sony continued to just do the HF series as it is, you've got to think, in the 80s and 90s, there was always a war on between the big manufacturers. They'd always come out with new formulations, better shells, etc., to try and get one up on the competition. But no one ever really knew how or when it would be the introduction of a new formulation. So they'd make the pancakes and then... They'd introduce a new formulation, and we've sort of seen that with the likes of the TDKSF, which, you know, I think was done to make use of old SA formulation, which they still had, but they'd introduced a new SA, so they needed to get rid of the old formulation, so they introduced the SF. Now, the standouts here for me, right, the EF with the very black tape, I'm pretty sure due to the nature of the tape, the colour, and the way that this could take plus six, that this could possibly be used. They've got old stashes of HFS or even HFES tape there. They didn't know what to do with them, so they got their cheapest shell, bunged in what was left, and sold this as, you know, as it says here, all-purpose recording. Excellent for all-purpose recording, you know, and... Just just a nice cheap tape. Just get rid of that stock which is there. And that was what became of the EF. And then maybe, just maybe, the EF was successful. And they went, well, we've got some super EF stuff. Maybe this, this like I say, records at plus six. Uh, I think there's remnants of super ferric in this one. And in this one. The FXI... Not quite sure, because there was the FX2 as well, which was a chrome, which, you know, I sort of thought had UX tape in it. I mean, if you look at the back of this, what does it say? Um, yeah, it doesn't say anything particular about this. It just says high-energy magnetic particle tapes, good sound quality. I'm not quite sure where the FX came from. I've no theory on that. Is it just old-generation HF tape when they moved over to the Gamma one? But this, this comes from 96, so... I doubt it because they were using gamma tape in 1990, so I doubt the tape in this is much older. I mean, I don't think the tape in this will be 80s tape in a mid-90s cassette. I don't really know about this one. And again, this HDF, it sort of biases quite similar to the FXI, but it's a good dirty ferric, this. That's what I like about this and the FXI. The nice dirty ferrics. And what do I mean about dirty ferrics? Well, dirty ferrics, you know, they always say that... Well, how can I put this right? You take a very crystalline digital source, which has always been digital, done on a laptop, and it can be quite sharp and digital. Now, dirty ferrets to me, 
you put that digital source onto this and the natural properties of the rust, and that's what it is, it's crushed rust on these tapes, it has its own natural compression. You run these a bit hot and it will compress it in a natural analog way and it can warm up a crystalline digital source. And that's what I mean by a dirty ferric. And these two, I like them, especially this one with the retro good looks. It warms up a crystalline digital source and makes it sound more analog. It could be perception, but like I say, perception is more important than reality. It doesn't matter what the truth is. It's what we perceive as being the truth is what we care about. So I like these because they are dirty ferrics. They're good for warming up crystalline sources, but not so great if you want to do an absolutely accurate copy of something because they do colour the sound. But the bottom line is, and like I keep saying, get to know your basic and affordable type ones. Get yourself a good deck. I don't sound like an audio funky going on about it, but get yourself a good deck. A good deck is an important thing to have. You only need one. Have one, look after it, keep it maintained, and you'll be good. But get to know these type of cassettes because, like I say, the Type 2 are going up and up in price. There's less and less of them, and they ain't making any more. But these are regularly available at a very good price and as you heard there these can make very very good recordings so stop thinking about perception of them being normal bias and just use your ears and listen to what they're like yes you put them on an oscilloscope and they might not sound as good uh, when it comes to looking at the graphs as a type 2 i'm not saying these are type 2 replacements i'm just saying that if you want to make a good recording these will make a good recording and some of them like I say, like these two, bit special. You make a good recording on these and say, hey, these are done on a super ferric. Would I be able to tell you without looking at the tape just by what's coming through the cassette deck and I'm listening to? I doubt any of us would. And that's why you should have a look for these because they are very good cassettes, even though I do suspect they're a mishmash of bits of better cassette tape that's been left over in Sony warehouses that they just want to get rid of. But, as always, find out for yourself, that is the fun of this hobby. So until next time, please like and subscribe, and take care. Bye-bye.